So um, we have the three entities that we usually work with. We talk about adductor-related problems, iliopsoas-related problems, and inguinal-related problems. And we want to identify uh, if the muscles that we include in these entities are uh, causing pain in this patient. Can you move on? up five centimeters? Ten? Yeah, like this. Perfect. So the patient is lying here, relaxed. And um, we start with the, the psoas. And the psoas muscle is a very strong muscle. And in footballers, especially, very strong. I will, in most recreational, normal footballers, not elite or anything, I will not be able to break him in this test with my size and strength. Then you can measure from there if you're much stronger and bigger than me or, or weaker. But this is my experience anyway. So when I do the examination test, I do it in this position, 80, 90 degrees, because if I do it here, and you lift your leg, please, and I push here, well, I'm testing the psoas, but I'm testing the rectus femoris as well, the TFL, uh, his ability to hold his knee stretched with his, his uh, quadriceps, and a lot of other stuff. So I try to isolate the psoas as much as possible, taking him into this position. So I put my arm here, and I say, you pull your knee towards your nose. And then I pull. And he, he is, and he pulls as much as he can. Come on, pull. He got injured? No. No? Oh, you just contradicted what I said. <laughs> well, he's a Dutch football player, so. Let's see the other leg. No, it's not my strength. No. OK, you pull. You pull. Come on, pull. Pull. Come on, you can start. In most cases, I would say I wouldn't be able to break him. And the very important thing is, is there a difference? Do you feel he's weaker? And if you're in doubt, use the measurements that you can get the physio to help you with if you're not a physio yourself and you want some more precise measurements, you can use the handheld dynamometer in some of the standardized ways. Measure, is there a difference? And if you have the patient in a, in a long um, treatment, then it's a good way to monitor uh, the, the, uh, the progression of strength. I ask him, do you feel any pain with this test? Do you feel uncomfortable with the test? If there's a psoas problem, it can be. But it could also be that he is stressing his hip joint, pushing, pulling like this. Of course. I mean, we are generating a lot of force into the hip joint doing this. And it could be the low back or SI joints. But I relate it also to the psoas. And then I do the full examination. And then I combine these examinations to see, well, if this and this is positive, but this and this and this is negative, then it fits all pointing mo mainly at the psoas or mainly at the hip joint, et cetera. This is the way we do it. So this was uh, one test. Then we do the palpation of the psoas. And uh, I, I do it with the, I find the anterior iliac spine here. Put my hands like this. So the anterior iliac spine is right there between my, my hands. And then, uh, I go to the lateral edge of the rectus abdominis, and then I push my fingers slowly down here, just pushing, and then I say, take a deep breath and relax. And just give me as much room as possible here. Good. And then you lift your leg five centimeters. Perfect. So now I can feel the psoas here under my fingers very clearly, and I can push my fingers up and down, just pushing the skin. So it's, it's a good way to do it. So you have the psoas. You can feel it like, like something, like a hard, round thing coming up against your fingers. And you can palpate like this, or you can palpate up and down like this. You are in the distal end. This is close to the ligament. This is close to the muscular tendinous junction. This is where you usually find pain in the psoas. So this is a good, good, good spot to do it. If you want to get even further down, closer to the tendon itself, then you give him a wedgie, like this. And then um, we'll have him. I like to find the sartorius muscle and palpate the sartorius. And to find the sartorius, I put him up in this position. And you hold your leg. So now the sartorius is visible here. I can see it. And I can put my fingers on the medial side on the, of the sartorius, stretch the legs. So now I have my hand. I know exactly where is the medial uh, edge of the sartorius. So I go as proximal as possible under the inguinal ligament. And in this position, I know that the psoas is right under my fingers. This is the only place where the psoas is located subcutaneously. 
medial for the sartorius and straight under the inguinal ligament. You could also say lateral to the femoral artery, which is a bit more, it's in here. So I put my fingers there, and to confirm that I'm in the right spot, lift the leg, no, just put it down again, just lift it five centimeters, exactly. So this is the psoas, you put it down, now it's soft, and you lift, and now it's hard. So I know I'm on the psoas. And again, asking for pain, asking for recognizable pain. Is it the pain that you know from the problems you have? Or is it just because I'm mean and putting my finger down in a sore spot? It's, it's important to differentiate as well. So these are the two palpations that we do for the psoas. Um, and then we do the Thomas test. If you come out and stand at the end of the couch. Like that. And then I'll ask you to take uh, this knee, like this, sit on the edge, and then I'll help you down, like this. So in this position, I pull in a little bit, like this, good. So in this position, I can uh, do two things. I can estimate whether he's tight or not, and of course I can make him tight if I want to. I can just push a little more. But I try to do it uh, as precise as possible by uh, stretching out his uh, lumbar lordosis by, I mean, now he's, there's room here, now I push, so around here. And then I take a look. If he is above horizontal, then it'll be a problem. He is not. And he is not very tight in his rectus either, as we saw with Goose in the uh, former session. He was very tight there. So this is one thing. Then I push, and then I grab him here, and then I just do a stretching of the psoas in this position. And the reason I'm standing here is if he is sore, and I'm just letting him hold, and I do this. He'll just let go with the arms. Yeah. So, so he'll just, I mean, it's, it's, I, have to, I can control easily the position, and I can make the bo most of, of the stretch with the least uh, power from me. So I just push here and push here. And then I ask the patient, is it painful, or is it just a tough stretching? So this would be my question. A lot, all athletes know what a, a real hard stretching is, so, so you can, they can differentiate. Always start on the good side, and after that, please be sure to help him up, because this is an uncomfortable position to get up from. Okay, if you like. So this was the psoas. Pain with th uh, is a tightness, and pain with uh, passive stretching in Thomas' test. Pain abdominal and under the inguinal ligament, medial to the sartorius, and then any weakness, any pain, discomfort, when you do the uh, isometric uh, test in, in a range of the psoas. The adductors, there's lots of squeeze tests uh, out there that you can use. Uh, you can use this position. You can use it in, in the flex position with a fist, or you can use your full arm, or you can do it in many ways. Um, you can also, uh, one of the squeeze tests that I would highly recommend you not to use is this one. So when you're pushing up here, because this is a test where you are really stressing everything, it's not saying anything about the adductors by themselves. It's, it's abdominals, psoas, uh, low back. It'll be anything. Uh, so what we try to do with the test is to isolate the muscle as much as possible. And if you're in this position, lifting off, you will have to compensate, and, and you're working all over now doing it. So instead, we have tried to, to do it, uh, isolate it as much as possible, and there's EMG studies supporting that this is one of the, the good ways to, to test the, the um, the adductor longus, especially. So we, and it's very important that it's in, in a neutral position. If you have a sore adductor here and you don't like to do adduction, very often you'll externally rotate and try to use other muscles to do the movement. And sometimes even with some of the players, I say, okay, try you, do, it, do it in this position, and they say, okay, you adduct, and they can't. It's, nothing's really happening. I say, come on, you have to, to do it. You put your legs together just like that. Sliding over, okay, now you know how to do it, so you know what you mean. And then I do it again, and then, ah, they're really afraid to do it. If they had it as a long-standing problem, they feel so uncomfortable doing it. So this is why a lot of our rehab in the first week or two is to sort of get them, and sometimes they have big muscles still, but they cannot use them. So we have to get the muscles to work again, activation of the muscles, and we use a lot of isometrics to do that, to, to uh, put ignition again to the, to the nerve. So this is, this is the position we do. First toe up neutral, put my hands in here, and push. So I can evaluate 
the strength, as Christian told us yesterday. It's a very rough evaluation. If you want to do more thorough eva evaluation, you use handheld dynamometers, et cetera. Then I ask for pain, and if he says, well, I got pain right here. Okay, is that the pain you know? Is it where, yeah, it's where it usually is. Okay, so the next thing I'll do is that I'll examine that spot. I'll always go to the, uh, the good side first, uh, because it is, again, it's, it's always sore to be uh, palpated straight on, on the, the periosteum. If you go down to the edge here of the tibia, it's, it would be sore, sore as well, so that's, that's the way it is. But then I do it in this position, putting him up here, and then using this hand to go in here. It's easy. Instead of standing like this, you can do it like this. I find the Dr. Longus tendon, it's easy to palpate. It's rolling there, and you can palpate it easily. So you go on the adductor longus tendon and then all the way up to the bone. And this is where the pain usually is. Not so much in the muscle or the junction or the tendon. In the acute setting it is, but in the chronic ones it's mostly at the tendon. Sometimes there can be some uh, muscle pain, some uh, active trigger points, some increased tension in the muscle, and of course you should, should uh, relate to that as well. But the main thing is the pain at the insertion, at the incisus, at the bone. So you follow the tendon all the way to the bone, and then it's the square centimeter at the bone where it inserts. This is where they, they usually have the pain. And when you do that and you put your finger there, then you ask, is it the same pain, the same side you had pain when you did the adduction test? And if it is, then I would say, okay, now we have actually two indications pointing to exactly that point. Doing a squeeze test, doing the palpation, and he still says. So in my mind, at least some of his groin problems are related to the adductor longus muscle uh, and the insertion, and we can start a plan from that. We have to do the full examination. We can easily find two or three uh, causes that is, uh, is affected as well, so you have to do the other stuff as well. But this is indication of we have an adductor-related groin problem. So the inguinal. Um, the inguinal is what you would call, some would call sports hernia or incipient hernia or Gilmore's groin or, or whatever. Um, what we're looking for here is can we somehow identify uh, the muscles that are involved in, in, in this weakness of the inguinal canal, especially the posterior wall, uh, and can we identify if they are painful? So, uh, we do, uh, what we do is, is to, to palpate the, the uh, pubic bone, the upper edge of the pubic bone, and I usually start uh, in the middle palpating the, the rectus uh, where it, it passes the pubic bone and then in front. I don't find very often in the chronic situation that the rectus abdominis is very much involved, at least I can't find pain with it. But if I then move, uh, if this is a pubic bone and this is the middle, and I have tested here, then I move out to the side, and then you will find that the pubic bone is like, it, it's got a corner, and then you sort of go down. At that corner, pubic tubercle. Also, if you can't find it, find the inguinal ligament, follow the inguinal ligament down, and it comes down right there. So medial, just medial to the inguinal ligament at the pubic tubercle, this is where the conjoined tendon is inserting. This is where the transverse abdominis and the external oblique are joining and going in right there. And this is where they are very often sore when they have an inguinal-related problem. And this is also uh, where we in ultrasound often can find that they, are, they have a thickening there as a, as a result of the enthroscopathy. We have no evidence of this, but this is, uh, this is my impression you're getting today. So I have now an indication that this could be a problem. So I want to get further into this. So we do a palpation uh, of the external opening through the scrotum. So I have the patient standing, I'm sitting, and I'm very carefully start on the good side first. It's uncomfortable as a lot of us in here will know. Uh, so we do it on the good side first so that they know this is, ah, this is how it feels, and then you go to the other side. And often I find that there's pain when you put your finger up there, and especially if you put your finger uh, lateral and distal, so that you do like, like this, if the patient is standing in front of you, this is a midline, and you put your finger up there, and then you go down lateral, sort of put your finger. This is where the posterior wall is. I will not claim that I can feel if the posterior wall is soft or, or weak or anything. That would be too much. But if there's pain there, and there's pain on this tubercle, and the history points to a suspicion of incipient hernia or, or 
Botulinia. Then I would say then we have some good clinical indications that this is the case. If they haven't been doing anything for a long time, I didn't do anything for six weeks, uh, so, but it's still there. I tried to run yesterday, but it was still there. Well, send him out to do something for a week if he has no pain and you still have a suspicion and get him back again after doing some exercise. And then very often you'll find that now you can, you, the pain is there. So what I do after that is I send them to ultrasound. I don't use ultrasound to diagnose it, but I use it to confirm or in some situations to tell me, well, it's not there. So as, as, um, as Phil told us uh, yesterday, you have a lot of uh, findings with bulging, uh, sports, uh, like hernia situations, uh, the, the, um, the herniographies that we used in the old days also showed a lot of these. So we can't just because the imaging is there, go for it. But on the other hand, if I find these indications clinically, the history is there, and there's nothing on the ultrasound, then I'll, I'll go step a little back and I'll take another look and because then I'll be in doubt. But if it's confirmed with an ultrasound that shows me that this looks a lot like what I think it is from the clinical examination, then to me, I begin to have the, the evidence that it's there. And then what do we do? Well, we do first a rehabilitation program that we try to do a lot of work, work out with the abdominals, and especially abdominals in the, in the, in the um, not so much in the inner position, but in the external position. Because footballers are not stressing, stressing the abdominals when they're in here. They're stressing them in this position. They're stressing them when they're kicking, when they're tackling, in positions like this. This is where they, they have, so this is where they need to be strong. And especially eccentrically strong, I think. So what we are working on now is developing exercises that we can do on a Swiss ball, for instance, with in extension and doing uh, strengthening of the abdominals uh, in that way. Again, we have no proof of this. We have some good experiences, and I'm really looking for the lacmus test that could tell me who needs surgery for this, and I should send to Shil, uh, or who uh, is, uh, can I just uh, say, no, this is exercises, you go to the physics. We don't know. And I can have patients where I have a high suspicion of surgery, and we end up doing well with, with, with exercise treatment, and the other way around. So it's, it's, it's still out there. And we are planning, and hopefully we can, we can do a um, um, multi-center international study here from Aspatar looking at it uh, in a randomized trial at, at some stage. We're working on that anyway. So these were the three entities. If you have pain with adduction against resistance and at the same side with palpation, then in my mind you have an adductor-related groin problem. If you have pain with palpation, uh, over or under the ligament, uh, and you have pain when you do uh, passive stretching in the Thomas test position, then you have an indication of either psoas related problem. And if you have pain at the pubic tubercle and in the external opening, you have indications of an inguinal related problem. And then, of course, we combine this with some imaging if we're in doubt, and uh, then the clinical uh, development will often show us where we are. But then we have this, this hip joint. We're stressing the hip joint with, with a lot of the tests that I've shown now. So we have to, to take a look at that as well. Sometimes with the x-rays, when you look at x-rays uh, here in Aspata, uh, especially with uh, Arabic players, it's very rare that you find any FAI. Uh, so I think there's a high uh, genetic uh, side of this, and we'll learn more about this, hopefully, uh, uh, from our studies and maybe Michael will tell us some this, something this afternoon about the ethnic ethnicity of FAI as well. I don't know how much studies out there, but we'll see. This is our impression here anyway, uh, that we don't have much FAI with, with the Arabic players, but with the Caucasian uh, players, we have more and uh, much more than we see in, in Europe. So we'll have to take a look at that. Um, but the tests that we do, very simple, uh, is I do a, a hip flexion. I just look for it like this. Is it painful? If it's painful, uh, it could be an indication of a hip joint problem, but it could also be an indication of a psoas problem because I'm really squeezing the psoas, pushing, pushing him in like this. Or if he has a very sore um, adductus uh, tendon or uh, inguinal tendon, I'm pushing and squeezing things. It, things are getting very tight in here, and you could, you could have pain from that as well. So it's not specific, but it, it's something that we very often find if you have an intraarticular problem. This is not painful. And if 
this is not painful and the impingement test is not painful, then my suspicion of the hip joint is very low. On the other hand, if it's there and all the other stuff that I mentioned is there as well, then I'm equally confused and then we have to go on with further examinations, of course. So flexion, then you could say external rotation, no problem, internal rotation, and you can do it in, in this position, you can do it in, in this position, you can do it with a patient sitting like this, you can do it prone like this, and this is something that I know that Michael Leinig will talk more about uh, in his talks on, on testing of this. So I'm not going more into this, but I often find pain here, pain here in these patients. Then we do the impingement test, and the impingement test is flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. So I do it in this position. And then I do like when you do the Hawkins test in the shoulder, and you can do it pushing him all the way here to see if you can find some, some side of the, some part of the, the uh, subacromial space where there's pain, uh, uh, putting the tubercle under the, in the, in the subacromial space, so you move your arm, you can do exactly the same here. You put him in this situation, push, push there, and then you can just move him from side to side. So now we are sort of squeezing, trying to squeeze all over the, and sometimes I find, no, this, ah, no, it's not that bad. And then I go, ah, something's there. And then I go over here, no, it's good again. So this is also to me a good indication that this would be a hip joint related problem more than a psoas problem because I would think that the psoas would be sore in this position anyway. But if you can sort of distinguish a few centimeters where ah, there's pain, there's no pain. Then again, to me, I begin to think more here. <coughs> um, if you could just wait and see if they, when they come and kick us out or? Uh, five more minutes. Five more minutes, good. So we have the, um, the lock roll test um, where you have the, the big lock of wood here and you roll it from side to side and you can discuss uh, how much value it's got. Um, I think if you have a pain, <coughs> a patient who says this is very, <coughs> excuse me, which is very painful, then I would say there would be an indication that this could be uh, a hip joint problem because the muscles are very relaxed in this position. So if there's a real pain reducing the pain and it's deep in here, again, I would think hip joint and then I could go in that direction. Um, you can also use the lock roll test to see if there's a, if there's, um, a capsular laxity. If you roll like this, he should sort of, as you can see, the foot is going back here. There's a spring because the capsule is holding him and pulling him back. If he is falling out and staying like this, then it can be an indication that there's a laxity of the hip joint. Uh, and it can be because of a trauma, for instance. Uh, it could be uh, subluxation. Um, I've seen it in, uh, for instance, water skiers, uh, uh, horseback riders who fell off the horse or some big traumas where they didn't, no one really realized that there was a hip trauma because lots of other things happened. But in some, some of these patients, you sometimes find that one foot is lying like this, the other one is up there. It could also be that they have been uh, in the OR uh, with a hypotroscopist who did a capsulotomy. And when you do a capsulotomy, uh, there's a little risk that you uh, get a little more loose capsule afterwards. It, it usually heals. Some people stitch it up, some doesn't. It's a bit of a controversy of whether you should or not. Uh, but there is some instability in, in some patients afterwards, which, which you, you, can, you can find in this position. Um, the last hip test, if you move to this side. Um, like you know, the, the, um, in the shoulder, a lot of the tests we do in the shoulder is, is very indirect tests. Um, if you do, if you do the, um, oops, if you do the, uh, the tests like, like in this position and this position, and then you press and say, well, there's pain and it could be AC joint, it could be, but it, we all know how specific they are. But you get the indication, if all of these tests are, are positive, then you have the idea there's something going on in that shoulder joint and you need to do further investigation. You need to use the imaging, you need to, maybe you, you put the scope in there. And this is the same here. This is a test, again, that is, to me, if you move a little more, like this. You can do it like this or you can take him to the end of the couch. Put him in a little bit of extension and then I do a rotation like this. So now I'm pushing the femoral head posteriorly 
asking for any pain, then I do it the other way around, and I'm pushing the femoral head anteriorly, anteriorly capsule, asking for pain. This could be, the last one you could say would be, if you want to go, like an apprehension test. It's also a posterior impingement test. If the patient says it hurts behind there, then some call it a posterior impingement test. If it hurts in front, some say that it's an apprehension, apprehension test. Like you do in the shoulder, up here, and you push, and you have pain here in the front of the capsule. One minute, okay. Any questions in the last minute? Any comments? Good, yeah, Mr. Childers. I don't, yeah, yeah, I don't. But <coughs> that's the whole idea, I think, of, of the program is that you do, I mean, in a lot of situations, for instance, if you take a knee, some very simple things, you say, okay, you do the Lachman test here, and you have this, uh, this laxity, and you know this, this, there's an ACL lesion there. But there's very few tests around the groin and hip where you can say, if this test is positive, then no doubt this is a problem. So what I do is I combine it. So if all the hip tests I just mentioned here are negative, then I'm quite uh, certain that this is a psoas and not the anterior capsule. On the other hand, if they're all positive as well, I quite agree with you, it can be from the hip joint as well that the pain is there. So uh, we're not claiming to differentiate 100%, but we're combining the information, and from that we can sort of... Um, Diagnostic ultrasound injection, as, as, as mentioned, is, is very, very good to do. Eight, 10 cc's into the joint, done ultrasound guided. You can see the capsule is lifting off, and then you know the, the, the uh, lidocaine is in there, and then have the patient do exactly the same tests that was hurting before, and if they are pain-free or much less pain now, then you have a very good indication that you have a hip joint problem. The next step would then be either to do a hip scope, or to do uh, MR atrography or uh, free Tesla MR, or it could be maybe to do what Kay is going to tell us about this afternoon, maybe do some conservative treatment before you go on with this. Depends a little bit on situation and uh, your experience and so on. There's still, this is, this is really, we're really out there where we don't know what we're stepping into. So it, it's new stuff, all of it. So it's, it's a lot to do with experience as well. Thank you.